So we, we are over time. So I will uh, move on to Gordon next and then I'll finish up. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Okay, has that worked? Okay, yes. Yep, that's come up. If you want to go to, is that slide view? If you go to slideshow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Karen, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yep. Karen's not talking about the ABC uh, Q&A that's, um, that's full up with camera stuff at the minute. Ah, uh, yes, definitely not. Um, um, yep. So slideshow, Gordon? So I'll, I'll roll away, right? Yes, yeah. Um, 15 minutes or, yeah. Yeah, so look, I'm going to um, uh, not use my entire 15 minutes, um, the day is drawing on. Um, look, lots of people help the study and it's not finished by any means and in progress is the most accurate way to describe it. But I have to single out from Mark McGough and Genova because we couldn't have done it without Genova and we couldn't have done it without um, uh, Mark McGough. And Mark essentially uh, took me to an outcrop on day one and he goes, you know, what's this? And I must admit, I thought, I thought, wow, you know, I've worked in Mount Isa all this time and I missed a big detachment fault. So what we found beneath this fault, it only had a very small outcrop. It was near um, the Swan um, prospect and in the shadow of the Mount Elliot um, chimney, more or less. But we discovered um, storylight garnet Boravian fasces, metamorphic mineral assemblages. And these, these are only formed um, as, as a result of a period of, of shortening, um, crustal thickening, um, modern type collision. And then remarkably, these were subject to very rapid exhumation so that they had been overprinted by low pressure, high temperature metamorphism, which is, was in the Bucken fasces um, and included andalusite. That's a pretty amazing um, depressurization um, of all the Boravian fasces around the world. This is the only place where I've seen it go that far. In Scotland itself, where Boravian and Buckham were first to find, you see the Boravian in the lower plate, as you do at, in, in the Mount Elliot area. And um, you see the Buckham in the upper plate, coeval. Here, the lower plate has gone all the way during exhumation while the upper plate is still essentially carbonaceous metapelites. These got really hot. Um, there was static growth of minerals like scapolite through the carbonaceous metapelites, which is what you expect in such a, a, a major extensional system because the juxtaposition of hot rocks underneath cold rocks means that the hot cold rocks above get a burst of heat. And what we could see causing this juxtaposition was a filonite which is like the micaceous equivalent of a myelinite. And so we went, well, we're gonna to have to work this one out. It's very interesting because when you extrapolate that fault regionally, as best as you're able, you, you really come to the conclusion that many of the deposits in this um, north, southwest, southeast part of the um, inlayer um, are not very far from the inferred structural position of that folded regionally developed attachment. Okay, so I'm, for this slide, I'm a bit like Pete. I spent yesterday in total panic because I thought it was yesterday and rang up to apologize because I was late uh, to discover an, at birth that there, there is Queensland time, which was an hour later, so I wasn't. And yes, I was um, a day um, early, which was embarrassing. But um, this is a talk the group put together uh, to help Olga Baraluva um, talk at the Denmark Structural Tectonics Group to explain to people what she was going to do for a PhD. And it, it really summarizes what we know um, then and some dating which tells you a little bit more about what we know now. Okay, so this, this, this fault was picked up by Mark McGough, then realized it was important, but also Mark Inman and the SMI had written a report and um, uh, had a bet both ways, I think, that, that it was either a detachment or a thrust or both. But since it has 
colder rocks in its hanging wall and hotter rocks in its foot wall, it's pretty clearly an attachment. What we had to do was um, do some mapping. Um, Mark had done quite a lot um, and start dating to try and understand the timing of things. Here's a nice picture which um, shows the small garnets overgrown by storylines with um, biotite growing in uh, cracks and pressure shadows. That's a, a pretty classic Barovian facies metamorphic mineral assemblage. And then as that depressurized, you can see the andalusite corroding and overgrowing um, that assemblage, which is amazing. The rocks of the lower plate, um, micaceous schist and um, phyllonites. The micaceous schist, you can see quite a lot of the, um, you know, the mica is not so messed up. Um, you can see quite a lot of the detail of the microstructure going deeper back into time. And then in the phyllonite, you discover that it's also very tightly um, kinked on, on a very fine scale. And it's a bit hard to actually date um, the phyllonite as opposed to what might have happened with the kinking. So we were not sure. So the dates that came out consistently told us that this was something that happened starting around 1510 um, with the second burst of activity around 1490 down to about 1480. And that, that result has been repeated maybe now 20, 30 times. So although I've got to say I'm one of the guilty parties, somehow we um, locked in this mythical D1, D2 scheme, D3 scheme, which has got as much substance as, as anything that is mythological, um, um, a largely a fairy story. And the, this dating has really started to overturn everything we thought we knew about um, the Mount Isa in Liam. One of the things we've all said is that it's the waning stages of the Mount Isa orogeny at 1500. It's not true. Actually, there was an amazing event at that time. So, so we went further following this detachment and found a very nice cross section through it at the um, Anser Mine and um, into the Gin Creek Granite. Now, this was a bit alarming because previous indoctrination had told us this is the extension of the Wonga detachment, which is supposedly a 1740 um, extensional system. And maybe it was 1710 as well, but no problem. Major extensional systems get used over and over again. What we can actually prove is that hot rocks um, got exhumed rapidly beneath cold rocks at about 1500. All the rest of it is based on a few zircon dates from from folded uplights and, and, and not necessarily wrong, but on the other hand, not necessarily correct. Um, the answer slate, the answer uh, she zone gave quite a good uh, glimpse at the thermal history. And you can see in the left-hand side, the detail of the argon spectrum pulls us up to about 1530. And from then onwards, things were rapidly cooling until there was another pulse of mineral growth at, in this case, 1467, 1470. Okay, so again, this broad delineation between things happening in the range 1530 to 1500, and then a second pulse of largely static activity, but also some renewed exhumation um, in the period 1490, 1470. And these, these numbers are, are now not just single numbers, there's quite a few of them. So what do we think that sort of structure is? Well, we've drawn many ones like this. Pete drew some you know, amazing uh, cross sections in his PhD thesis. And this is really um, not, not a lot different in concept. A major detachment fault, which um, moved um, the upper plate relative to the lower plate southeastward um, and exhumed um, the, the, um, the, the forming um, um, plutons of the Williams batholith. This would have caused large scale um, dehydration um, and fluid movement. 
And those fluids, of course, move up until they get the structural boundary caused by the detachment. And then um, because it's happening late in the history of the detachment, they also meet the redox boundary um, caused by the, by the juxtaposition of the carbonaceous um, metapilites. But the real shocker <clears throat> is the timing of those fabrics, right? It's very clear that they are dominantly 1500, but they're folded. And they're folded by things that we have thought in the past to be D2 structures. So that's saying D2 is actually much younger than 1500. It's not necessarily so, this is ongoing work, but that's where it's leading. If you map the, um, the trajectory of the detachment based on the folding and stuff in the rocks underneath, folding and folding and juxtaposition of this, that and the other, this is the sort of geometry you get on a, um, on a cross section uh, of about oh, 40 kilometers um, across the um, ISCG corridor. You get the, the CMP syncline, a big antiformer dome of, of the Gin Creek granite with the detachment fault curving around it, then an infold, and then various other infolds as you go across. When you look at big structures like the Hebden syncline, I must admit I sat up there and, and thought, gee, I, I seem to remember these rocks. And then um, the um, students I was with gave me a paper to read. And after a little while, I realized I was one of the authors. Um, and, and we were wrong. Um, this is not a D2 structure, as people have said. It actually might tighten an existing D2 fold, but um, the amount of shortening in this later shortening is in excess of 50% um, of, of the horizontal of strain. So these are, these are big ductile structures which are occurring um, late. So we tried to work out the timing of those structures. And then this is some of the work done by Olga with um, assistance in collecting samples from Mark. Um, Marnie Forster having done their measurements and I did modeling and simulation. And we've now begun to be able to routinely date um, any fault breaker you like. And these are the timing of the, some of the fault breakers of the Mount Dor structure. You can see there are Grenville um, um, and all the way through to Taramini. And so the Mount Dor fault is a Rodinian, a Rodinian fault. You can't exclude an earlier history. There's just no evidence for it. And the stuff on the left of that spectrum is, um, tells you about the thermal evolution. Um, and basically the, these movements started at about 1350, which is the Elsevierian. So basically this is saying that Mount Isa has a very significant Rodinian history, which likely can involve up to 50, in my opinion, like Julius is the same, where the strains in this time period are probably up to 80%. Okay, so this, this um, really, um, is, is a big structure. It affects probably all of the southeast part of the uh, Mount Isa inlayer. There's some evidence for uh, the detachment in the, in the portal of um, Cannington. Um, there's little dips in, and, and um, appearances of it over a, a very large area. But in terms of the Gin Creek um, granite, which we all in the past used to argue was an analog for the Wonga detachment, it's a doubly plunging antiform which is, um, has a carapace shear zone, um, which was, was active at, at, in the period 1530 up to 1500 and caused um, denudation um, and, and exhumation of those rocks from um, middle crust to surface levels. Thanks very much. Excellent, thanks very much, Gordon. Uh, we could take one quick question if anything comes in quickly, because you did uh, stick under your 15 minutes, and and I will do the same. I, I've got I've so. got one, Karen. It's Pete. Yes. Okay. Who is this? Pete, your 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 prodigy. Pete. <laughs> no, I'm, just I'm, I'm going to give you a hard time. No, no, it's interesting because when the work that we've done in in the Western Fold Belt show, well, I think, is convincingly shows that the the major D2 structures that people interpret are much um, older than the eyes and erogeny. So they're the Leichhardt event and the eyes and erogeny is actually pretty weak. Yeah. And then, and then you're saying that the structures that are in the, in the Eastern fold belt are much younger, which I don't have an argument with, which makes us, makes us think about 
what actually is the isonerogeny. And if you look at the structures that are sort of predating that, it's a bunch of recumbent folds. You go to Broken Hill, it's the same thing. You go to Mount Painter, where we've done a lot of work, and it shows that that period that overlaps with the eyes and erogeny is all extensional. So my, my, I guess my question is, are we, you know, when we talk about the eyes and erogeny and all those recumbent folds and all that high temperature metamorphism that's stated at the you know, eyes and erogeny, have we, have we completely muffed it up and we're looking at largely a, an extensional you know, system rather than, than, a, than a shortening regime? Now, I'm just throwing it out there as something to discuss. I think I think the answer, Pete, is that there has been episodes of extreme extension, just like other parts of the world and other origins, and and episodes of um, of, you know, of 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 you know a great deal of shortening. But I think the one thing that is true is we have to throw away this belief that there's a D one D two regional fold system. It's wrong. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think we have to um, start using the method developed by Marnie Forster in her PhD, which um, is tectonic sequence diagrams. We don't even teach D1, D2, D3 when I um, show kids stuff at Vermeuri and stuff these days. I make them do sequence diagrams. And then, you know, it's no problem if some north-south trending folds over in the west happen to be 200 million years older than some north-south trending folds in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the east. And what should happen in, in terms of mapping and, and GSQ, really these sequence diagrams should be part of the legend because they, they're consistent over, um, over significant parts of map sheets. But when you start getting absolute dates, we can now date um, feldspar in brectures routinely. And we are doing it. And it, it is like any new source of data, it, it takes away blinkers that you had on before because you didn't have that sort of data and 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 the data is inexorably leading in olympic dam in south australia in places that pete just said towards a much more vigorous redinian history that we all missed 